I have the privilege of talking to you about being ministering the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I, had, I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit back in 1973. And um, it was honestly life-changing for me. I was 17 years old, and um, God really it was transformative. Um, it was, I think shortly, it might have been 1972. I, quite, I can't honestly quite remember now. But I know I was, I think I was called to the ministry in February of 1973. I'm trying to remember when I was baptized. Anyway, it was a while ago. Now, Holy Spirit, we thank you for the privilege of being baptized in the Spirit. And I pray today, Father, in Jesus' name, uh, that you would just equip us further, Lord, in how to minister the baptism of the Spirit. Amen. Let me just talk about this for a moment. We, we all know here in Europe, especially the Welsh Revival, was at the very foundations of the Pentecostal Revival. And the Pentecostal Revival, some say, began January 1st, 1901, um, in Topeka, Kansas. Um, there was a man named Charles Parham, and um, I've met his granddaughter. She's an extraordinary intercessor, I might add. And he, in his studies, be began to determine that there was another experience after salvation with the Holy Spirit. Now, as you may know, in the, out of Wesley and out of Methodist, which came right out of here, out of England, John Wesley himself believed in another experience after the Holy Spirit, which was sanctification. Um, he believed in one instance you could be totally sanctified. How many of you wish that was so? And um, he even wrote a very famous track on it. At the end of his life, he only met one man who may have obtained it. So, but anyway, through that, there began to be a hungering in Christians. Is there something else after conversion? Does the Holy Spirit want to do something in our life? And by the time you come into 1901 with Charles Parham, he began to teach that Christians could be baptized in the Holy Spirit and the evidence was praying in tongues. So there in January 1st, um, right after midnight, there were a number of students praying in Kansas. They'd been studying the book of Acts and one of them, Agnes Os Osmond, she spoke out in tongues. In fact, I can't remember what they claim. Multiple uh, known human languages were spoken. All the students were praying in tongues. Now, what's interesting, a few hours before she was baptized in the Spirit in Rome, believe it or not, the Pope of that time basically saying, come Holy Spirit. And he, for a number of years, there was a young nun in the Catholic Church who God had spoken to. She had been writing the Pope saying, the Holy Spirit is going to come on us. The Holy Spirit is going to come on us. And she was even encouraging. She said, ask for the Holy Spirit the first day of that year. So it's interesting how God works. And so you know the story um, from Charles Parham. He went to Houston. That was back in the day in America where African Americans had almost no rights. And in Houston, an African American wasn't even allowed to come into the classroom with white Americans. But there was a young African American named William Seymour, a one-eyed African American preacher, um, who had basically been touched in the holiness movement. He moved to Los Angeles to pastor a little church, and he, a revival broke out, and he and six of his members, the Holy Spirit fell on them. They were baptized in the Holy Spirit. They went out to a horse barn in Azusa Street. The rest is history. For the next three and a half years, it's like the Holy Spirit of God hovered there. People came from all over the world, major leaders, they came out of Sweden, which was, or out of Scandinavia, I think it's Sweden, one of the main places where the Spirit of God spread out into Europe. And in three and a half years, thousands and thousands of people were baptized in the Spirit. Now, we know today, at least according to 2011, there were 584 million people who believed the gifts of the Spirit were for today. And it is people like us who accept the power and the current work of the Holy Spirit it is the fastest growing religious movement in the world. Um, when you look at big churches around the world, they have something common, most of them. They believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. They believe that all the gifts we see in the Bible are still for today. I'll never forget when Ron Lewis, one of our great Every Nation leaders, God opened a supernatural door for him in China. This is many, many years ago. And he went into China with the leader of the underground student movement who had led his university onto Tiananmen Square and been radically saved through that experience. 
And I'll never forget, Ron began to preach on the baptism of the Spirit there in Beijing. And a howling a wind blew down into that building. Every papers flying everywhere, and they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. And from that moment, it spread throughout the house church movement in China. Now, there's one thing I want to talk to you about that's very important. You know, when you start talking about the move of the Spirit in the 20th century, some people divide it into three waves. Peter Wagner was famous with talking about the third wave. Personally, I believe there were four ways, but that's all right. And so what's more important is to understand how pneumatology or the study of the Holy Spirit is changed in each wave. In the Pentecostal revival of the Spirit, what they believed was this. The baptism of the Holy Spirit was always subsequent or after salvation, and it was always a separate experience, and you always prayed in tongues as a sign. That was the, that was the Pentecostal movement. In fact, laying on hands to be baptized in the Spirit was uncommon then. They believed in what was called tearing. If you remember the word tearing, it comes out of the King James Version of the Bible, where it says they tarried in the upper room. Like when I was baptized in the Spirit during the charismatic renewal of 1973, I didn't know anybody to lay hands on me. I didn't know it was possible. Now, my dad had been a deacon in a church that didn't believe in it, and he had said, as long as I'm a deacon, we'll never have that Holy Spirit in this church. Too bad my mom snuck out and got baptized in the Spirit. And so when there was a growing hunger in me, I didn't know anyone to lay hands on me. So I would go to our little church, my dad was a pastor by then, and night after night with a friend, I would cry out to be baptized in the Spirit for two or three months. And finally, one night, the power of the Holy Spirit hit my friend and I. He began to sing, he was a great singer, in beautiful tongues, and I interpreted his tongue before I even spoke in tongues. And I was so drunk in the Holy Spirit, they probably should have locked me up. I'd drive through parking lots yelling, get baptized in the Spirit, I was crazy. That's another story, anyway, okay. Now, when the charismatic renewal um, came, that was about 1959. Of course, it came all over the world and it went into mainline churches, Episcopalian, Anglican, uh, Presbyterian, Methodist, historic denominations. Um, in America, it basically started um, with a man whose last name was Bennett, stood up in his big church in California and said, I prayed in tongues. Time Magazine carried it and so did Newsweek and it spread through the mainline denominations. And it was in that move of the Spirit, I was baptized in the Spirit. And they looked at being baptized in the Spirit a little differently than the Pentecostals. Unlike the Pentecostals who said it's always subsequent and there are always tongues, the charismatic renewal said it, it can come when you're saved, but it's normally after you're saved. We know even in the house of Cornelius, they were saved and kind of almost baptized in the Spirit simultaneously. And the charismatic said, Tongues is normally the sign, but it could be other gifts of the Spirit as well. Which probably when you look in Scripture, that is probably the closest to what Scripture says. Then, in the 1980s, what Peter Wagner calls the third wave, it swept, at least in America, through the evangelical ranks. And in fact, many, many scholars, some of the most famous scholars in America now, theological scholars, are all what they call um, continuous and they believe that all the Holy Spirit's gifts have continued unto today. But unlike Pentecostals and unlike Charismatics, they believe that being baptized in the Spirit was never subsequent. That when you got saved, you had all the Holy Spirit you were going to get and you had to activate it. And so, and they also believe that you did not have to speak in tongues, that any gift could be a sign. And that's affected America quite a bit. Um, and normative in the Bible, and we'll look at that in a moment, is that typically in Scripture, people were saved, then baptized in the Spirit. It was typically a separate experience. And here's what I've learned in America. Uh, today in Spirit-filled churches, we probably have millions of Christians who've never been baptized in the, the Spirit. And the reason we do is when you treat the baptism of the Spirit as something you just get when you're saved, people typically cease to get it at all. And it's so important that we understand that there is an, another experience with God through the Holy Spirit after someone is saved. And it's called the baptism of the Spirit. And all that is in your notes, and I'm not going to stay there long. But when you look in John 20, 22, 
Jesus said to his disciples, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. How many of you know if Jesus says that something happens, raise your hand. If the Son of God breathes on you, yet to the same group of people, in Luke 24 he said, I'm going to send you what my Father has promised and stay in the city until you've been clothed with power. What I think is that in John 20, 22, they probably received the new nature, but still there was another experience waiting for them where they'd be baptized in the Spirit. Um, of course, you know the story, Acts 2, 3. Um, they were baptized in the Spirit there in the upper room. In Acts 10, 45, it said, the circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. Um, you have to wonder about that. That's the only place in Scripture where we see people simultaneously being converted, seemingly, and baptized in the Spirit. Why do you think there's an exception? I think it's because God realized those Jewish believers were not going to lay their hands on Gentiles. And God, in his wisdom, saved them and filled them with the Spirit. And when they heard them speaking in tongues, obviously that was a sign to them. They realized, we got to water baptize these people. They've been baptized in the Spirit. Um, of course, you know that our means, the New Testament, under our means we find two models for receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Tearing, which is waiting and waiting, and laying on of hands. Normal in the New Testament was laying on of hands. And I've had the privilege of seeing hundreds of people baptized in the Spirit um, through the laying on of hands. And that's what I'll talk to you about today. Um, so receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit through the laying on of hands seems to be normative. We know in Acts 8, 14 through 19, when Philip went and began to evangelize the Samaritans and hundreds and hundreds of them were saved, two of the apostles came down from Jerusalem and laid hands on these new converts to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In Acts 9, 16, Paul asked the group of disciples at Ephesus, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They go, man, we never even heard of the Holy Spirit. And as the Bible says, he laid hands on them, the Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. It's just amazing what you see in Scripture. Now, let's talk about this for a moment. Let's talk about this laying on of hands. You can look under our model, and I'm going to be on the point preparation. In my opinion, Luke 11, 9 through 13, has a number of important concepts. It says this, So I say to you, ask, it will be given to you. Seek, and you'll find. Knock, and the door will be open for you. Everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks on the door, it'll be open. When you read it in its full context through verse 13, we know he's talking about the Holy Spirit. And here is what I find. There are two main um, problems when you're preparing someone to be baptized in the Spirit. The first one is, you know, they're going to feel like, well, what if I don't get it? And here is what I typically tell them. If someone, I lay hands on them and they do not, they're not baptized in the Spirit right away, I use this passage. The Bible says this, if you ask, you'll receive. If you seek, you'll find. If you knock, the door will be open. Here's what I'll tell them. Listen, you haven't received right now. Let's seek God and find out why. And when we find out why, let's press in. Let's keep knocking until you're touched by the Spirit of God. Now, the other thing that talks about, which is really interesting in that passage, it says this, if you ask your dad, if you ask one of your parents, I'm just ab-living here, for an egg, will they give you a serpent? No. How much more will your Father in heaven give you the Holy Spirit? So when you look at that, the other thing I find with people is many of them are afraid. Like, what's going to happen to me? Am I going to go crazy? And some of them may even have theological problems coming out of a church where they don't believe in that. And so in my own experience, these are the problems that I have found when I'm dealing with a person that wants to be baptized in the Spirit. First of all, some of them have theological problems. Um, they believe that the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit ceased at the end of the apostolic age. Now, we don't believe that, and there are books on that, and I've, I've written some addendums on it for our Every Nation family 
I don't think I sent them along. They're about 40 pages. But if they have theological problems, and they go, well, you know, I'm not sure I believe in it. It's pretty clear to me, until you believe in it, you're not gonna receive it. And so that's when they're gonna need a bit more preparation. Um, some people have experiential problems. I've met people who've had pretty bad experiences being prayed to receive the baptism of the Spirit. Maybe people were just screaming in their ears, be filled, be filled. Maybe people were trying to help the Holy Spirit and shaking them some. Uh, maybe the people were kind of saying, just say it a little louder with your mouth. And so they're a little traumatized. They're in spiritual trauma. They go, well, you know, this kind of happened to me before. And heck, I said, the people shook me so hard, up my neck, my neck got tight. So these are other things you can experience. Some people have um, conscience problems. We know throughout Scripture that people can affect their conscience. It can be corrupted. It can be defiled. And so if someone is in pretty deep sin, they've lost their confidence. And um, it's important to deal with that. And I may say, you know, I, I want to really be baptized in the Spirit. And I'll begin to pray, and I can see something's wrong. And I may say, have you affected your conscience? They go, well, Pastor, I've been in porn all the time. And if that's the case, I want to stop right there and help them find the cleansing they need and the forgiveness they need, then pray for them. Um, some people have spiritual problems, and I, I've learned this, that if someone has been deeply involved in witchcraft or the occult, that's one of the things that can kind of block the baptism of the Spirit. I don't know about you, but a lot of times when I lay hands on people and I can feel the power of the Holy Spirit going out of my hand, it's almost like I can feel blocks in there. So if someone has been involved in the occult, seances, even as a kid playing with Ouija boards, that kind of stuff, right there I'll help them pray, help them ask for forgiveness, cleanse that. These are just some of the things that I've learned in decades of doing this that can hinder someone from being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, here is what I found when it comes to ministry whether I'm dealing with a trauma, whether I'm dealing with someone that's really tormented demonically, um, whether I'm helping someone that wants to be baptized in the Spirit, I always prepare them. And one of the reasons we have such a problem in ministering to people is we minister to them before we've even prepared them. So when I'm sitting down with someone that's been, to be baptized in the Spirit, I'll do a little homework. I'll make sure their conscience is okay. Um, I'll make sure that theologically they believe in it. Because if I don't, I'm going to pray and pray and nothing may happen. And so once I've prepared them, and once I've given them, I said, you've ever had a bad experience with this? Are you confused about scripture? And once I've found that, okay, they're prepared, then I want to talk about imparting something to them. Now, one of the scriptures I find that's most helpful when it comes to the Holy Spirit is John 7, 37 through 39. Um, this is the great scripture. And what it says, and this is the, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Ingathering. Um, by the time we come to the book of John, that feast has gone eight days, not seven days. And Jesus, on the last day of that feast, says this. If anyone here is thirsty, let him come and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up until that time, the spirit had not been given because he had not been glorified. When I look at seeing someone receive the Holy Spirit, whether it's for the first time being baptized in the spirit, or staying filled with the Spirit, I find these five things are important. One, are they thirsty? Do they really want it? Has someone just talked them into it? Are they unsure? So thirst is the key. Then they've got to come. I can't baptize them in the Spirit. When I'm preparing a person, they've got to learn you're coming to Jesus. Thirdly, they've got to drink. They've got to open their mouth, and we'll come back on all of these, and receive. Fourth, They've got to believe what the scripture says. If they don't believe what the scripture says, if they're confused theologically, if they're really wondering about it, are you sure this is for today? It's going to be harder normally. There are exceptions, but normally not. 
And lastly, we're talking about manifestation, flow. Now, thirst. Let me say it again. If a person is not thirsty for the Holy Spirit's power, they're not going to drink. And a lot of times I'll remind them right there on the spot. And you can see the scriptures I'm using. And I'll say things like, if Jesus told his disciples not to minister till they had this, how about you? If Jesus himself, before he started his ministry, when he was water baptized by John, the spirit came upon him. And so my, my question to them is, if Jesus needed it, or these demonstrated we needed it, if his disciples needed it, how about you and I? And so I may take them through scripture for a moment, demonstrating to them the importance of this. And then, of course, when it comes, and I'll tell them over and over, I can't give you the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit may come out of my hands and parted to you. There may be an impartation, but you're going to ask Jesus. Jesus is the one that went to heaven and asked the Father, send the Holy Spirit. Then drink to me is an interesting metaphor. When you look in John chapter 4, 13 through 24, we know the word drink is a metaphor for believing. It's a metaphor for worship. And a lot of times when I'm laying hands on them, I'll, I'll say, you want to drink in the Spirit? Just ask God for the Holy Spirit. Begin to worship. Begin to thank Him. I'll be more concrete on that in a moment. And then believe. I've already told you that if they have a cessationist background, I mean, if they have a very rational background, I don't see this, I encourage you to help them see it before you pray for them. Some people just say, well, I'll just see if God will baptize in the Spirit. Then they'll believe, and that can happen sometimes. But typically, I want, to repair, I want to prepare them first. Now, manifestation. Flow in John 7, 38, those who come to Jesus and drink are promised rivers of living water will flow from within them. Now, what I believe these rivers speak of are the gifts and power of the Holy Spirit. As I said before, tongues, I think, is the normative sign of the New Testament. When Peter saw them praying in tongues, he goes, we've got to water baptize them. They have the gift of the Spirit. But like I say, some people, I interpreted tongues before I spoke in tongues. Um, my dad, he did not speak in tongues that first moment. So there are times that might happen, but normative is tongues. How many of you pray in tongues? I will tell you right now, I can't imagine Christianity without praying in tongues. Um, the importance of praying in tongues is not merely it lie in the fact that it's a sign or indicator of being baptized in the Spirit. Um, Paul makes an interesting statement. He says this after emphasizing how much more important prophecy is when you're in community. He says, anyone who speaks in tongues edifies themselves, but he who prophesies edifies the church. But I would like every one of you to speak in tongues. In fact, in that same passage, Paul says, I speak in tongues more than every one of you. Now, if he's just said, when you're in church in a corporate worship service, don't speak out in tongues unless there's an interpreter, then goes on to say, I pray in tongues more than all of you. Why? Why is tongues so important? I love to pray in tongues. Sometimes at night, I'll do it just a tongue walk. On my backyard, I'll just pray in tongues and wait on the Lord and see how he wants me to pray. Uh, Paul goes on to say, if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. He says, you utter mysteries by the spirit. In other words, when we pray in tongues, the Holy Spirit prays through our spirit in words that are unintelligible to our minds. Jude 29 says that when we pray like this, our faith is built up. Now, we know, Paul says, there are tongues of men and of angels. That means God can speak to you through, in an, through an angelic language or through a human language. Never forget, as a young believer, I'd been baptized in the Spirit for a number of months. I was in the military, and I was in Hebrew class, learning Hebrew. And my professor um, was a chaplain, but not a saved chaplain. And I was just real burdened for him, so... I went up to see him, and I had the lowest grade in the class at the time, so I thought, what do I have to lose? If I offend him, it can't be any worse. So I went up, and I said, could I lay hands on you and pray for you? 
That's really not done in the army with like a private and an officer. He goes, why not? So I laid hands on him and began to shout and pray in tongues. And you know, he looked at me and goes, okay, that's got to be God. He said, I know how stupid you are, and that's perfect Hebrew. So <laughs> th there are times when God will, I've seen it other times. I was, as uh, some of our leaders from the Philippines know, I was at a Healing the Human Soul class, and um, someone, someone was, dem I was praying over someone. I was asked someone they wanted to be prayed for. No one's volunteered since this moment. Happened to be a great athlete, and I was casting a demon out of him. Next thing I knew, I was praying in tongues, and one of the Filipino leaders basically was running up with a bucket. I said, why are you doing that? He said, in the Filipino, you're, you're basically telling him to vomit it out. And so, anyway, you never know what God might do and what might come out of your mouth. Now, normally, though, when I'm worshiping, every once in a while I feel like it's human languages. A lot of times it seems angelic. How does tongues build up your faith? Um, well, obviously, it takes faith to pray in a language you've never heard. But in Romans 8, 26 through 28, this is one of the verses I like best. How many of you like me have ever not known how to pray? Raise your hand. You're just stuck. I'll never forget when our, our third son had joined our son Peter um, on the West Bank in a very dangerous refugee camp, and they both got, um, what did they get again, Kathy? Like parasites. They both got parasites. An older brother was healed. Robert wasn't, and he went down from about 228 pounds to 107 pounds skin and bones dying. And I'll never forget that day. I was holding him in my arms. My tears were splashing down on his body. His mother would tell you, he's covered in bed sores by this point. And um, my dear, dear friend, Phil Benassi, who's one of our, our members of our international leadership team, called and said, Jimmy, put that boy down and go outside and pray in tongues. And as I went outside and began to pray in tongues, I was flooded with peace. It's like when, when Kathy had cancer many, many decades ago, she's been long healed, and they said, we think your wife's cancer is in her brain, and we had four small children at home, the youngest being 18 months or so. And driving back home, I began to pray in tongues, and I was flooded with peace. Why? How does that work? I think Romans 8, 26 and 27 tells us, in the same way, the Holy Spirit helps our weakness. We don't, know what we, we don't know how to pray in crisis, in trauma, in pain, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. What does that mean? When you come to that place, you're just out of words. Whether your you know, native language is you know, English or German or French or the many languages we have represented here, there's no words in your vocabulary. You, you don't even understand what you're going through. The Bible says the Holy Spirit will pray through you. He knows perfectly what you're going through. He knows God perfectly. He is God. And all of a sudden, even though you don't understand it, you've perfectly communicated with God and you've been connected to him. His peace floods into you. Now, a number of scholars, this phrase, the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. They believe it's the same type of praying described in 1 Corinthians 14 too. For anyone who speaks in a tongue utters mysteries. Or if I pray in the Spirit, my spirit prays. One of these scholars is Gordon Fee. Um, he, was, he was in Canada for years. He was probably the first Pentecostal to be an acclaimed scholar, one of the greatest New Testament scholars, really, of his era. And um, he says when you study um, this passage, he believes it, that it is tongues. Now, the Greek word translated wordless in the NIV can be interpreted as either silence or inexpressible, no words for it. If the second definition is accepted as a translation, and many accept that, this passage is describing a person who cannot find words for what they're feeling or facing. That's been me many times. So Romans 8, 26, 27, in my opinion, perfectly captures what happens when you connect with God.
Beloved, I cannot tell you how important tongues is. And the older I get, the more I depend on tongues. When I was a young man, I'd drive these great men and women of God around. They'd be in my car. I'd look back, they'd just be muttering in tongues. Like when they weren't talking to me, they were praying in tongues. I know why now. Because the older you get, as you begin to get out of your natural strength, you need the strength of God evermore. I have found, as I'm in my private prayer times, my, my tongues will change in tone. They'll change in tenor. Many of you have seen that in your own life. Sometimes I'll find myself in spiritual warfare, and the, the whole tone of my tongues will change. And I'll intermix tongues, and I'll just quote scripture, then pray in tongues. Now, although tongues is both the expected as well as the accepted sign of being baptized in the Spirit, probably not the only sign. In Acts 19, 6, when Paul prayed for them, the Bible says they spoke in tongues and prophesied. It's interesting to note in Numbers eleven twenty five, 25, you're probably familiar with that passage, kind of an Old Testament impartation of the Spirit. You remember that story, Moses was real mad. These are your people, they're not my people, this is your fault. He got in a big argument with God. I didn't bear them, you bore them. And finally he goes, kill me or don't make me be a pastor anymore. Thankfully God didn't take him too seriously. And he instead said, listen, you don't need more strength, you need more help. And he got 70 of his leaders and God took of the spirit on Moses, put it on them, and as a sign, they all prophesied, though never again. That's interesting. Um, so there's no way I can tell you how important tongues is. Yet, the most important purpose of being baptized in the Spirit is not tongues and the gifts of the Spirit. It is the fact that through the baptism of the Spirit, you're empowered to be a greater witness. You're empowered to share with your friends, to evangelize, to spread the love of God abroad. I mean, Jesus in Matthew 28, 18 through 20 says, listen, all authority in heaven's been given to me. Go and make disciples. Now, let me give you some practical steps to seeing someone baptized in the Spirit. Uh, how do we go about this? And I'm sure the majority of you know, but let, at least let me give you some steps in my own experience. Um, let's say I'm going to minister some of the baptism of the Spirit, which is a pretty normal thing in my life. Um, once I have prepared them, I checked their conscience. I said, do you have any theological questions for me? Do you really want this? Anything I've ever learned in ministry is I don't assume things. Typically, if I've ever ministered to you, if prophetically in a meeting, maybe a little different, but I'm gonna talk with you, you'll notice me close my eyes a lot. It's really not because I'm sleepy. Although, I get fairly sleepy, and I have been known to doze off in an appointment, don't tell anybody that, but typically, I'm waiting on the Holy Spirit for information. And the one thing I've learned in ministry is when the Holy Spirit speaks to me, I typically format it as a question. Like if someone says they've been terribly abused, I won't say, hey, God told me you were abused. Why wouldn't I do that? Well, what if I'm wrong? I might plant something in their mind. Or what if they're not ready to deal with it? So I might say, huh, you know, growing up, how was it? Did you ever have some treatment that hurt you? I'm very careful. And so a lot of times when I'm asking people questions, whether I'm preparing them to be baptized in the Spirit or a trauma wound being touched or something, I'll use what the Holy Spirit tells me to ask questions, not to make statements. Now, once I've prepared them, and when I'm ministering the baptism of the Spirit, or when I'm casting out a demon or whatever I'm doing, I'm calm. Because a lot of people are nervous. So I'll say, listen, I'm, I'm going to put my hands on you and... And especially when I'm dealing with opposite gender, I try to, I put my hand on their head, not on their knee, very careful with that. I'm going to put my hand on them and I'm going to say, listen, I'm going to put my hand on you and I'm going to pray for you. And the reason that my hand's on you is I said, there are times when the power of the Holy Spirit comes right out through laying on of hands. Now, once I've done that, I pray. And I have the person I'm praying for I have them ask to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and to pray in tongues. I have them ask directly. Now, I'm going to encourage them in this way. According to Acts 2-4, the, 
the disciples spoke in other tongues on the day of Pentecost as the Holy Spirit enabled them. What does that mean? What does it mean the Holy Spirit enabled them to speak in tongues? In other words, the Holy Spirit gave them the words to say. Now, I have seen this happen in a number of ways. At times, I've noticed people hear the words in their conscious mind. Have you ever seen that? They go, man, I'm hearing all these weird little words in my mind. What do I do? What do you do? Say them. And so I may say, now listen, as I pray for you, you may hear some words you've never heard before. If you do, just begin to whisper them out to the Lord. Um, other times, so I'll ask for, other times I've seen people begin to stammer and study. Ever seen someone's tongue begin to stammer? I watch people go, I don't feel anything. Like, nah, 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 nah. What's happening? Nah, 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 nah. I mean, I, their tongues just go crazy like that. They go, nothing's happening. I go, well, something's happening. You're just not aware of it. And so I've watched their tongue stammer. Um, when, when that is the case, I help them understand you're beginning to speak in tongues. I am? Yeah, that. What is that? That whole well, tongues is beginning. And so it didn't sound like I thought it would. I said, if it sounded like you thought it would, it's bypassed your mind, don't worry. So then I said, slow down. You're beginning to speak in tongues. And that's typically all the encouragement um, they need to flow at a deeper level. Now remember, praying for someone to be baptized in the Spirit has nothing to do with your volume. Many people go, the longer it takes, the louder they get. That does not help. The passion of your prayers doesn't help. How emotional they are may even be wrong. Let the Holy Spirit do the work. It's his work. It's his business. I don't feel like I'm a failure if they don't pray in tongues right away. God knows. Now, if the person does not speak in tongues or manifest another sign of being baptized in the Holy Spirit, I gently probe them in order to find out what's going on. Uh, if they continue to have trouble, I'll give them some scriptures to read, and, I'll, and basically I'll say, you go home and pray. I want you to meditate on these scriptures, and every night I want you to ask Jesus to baptize you in the Spirit. And next week when I see you in church or when I meet with you, we'll pray again. Now, the other thing you have to do is prepare them for residual unbelief. If you remember right, once you were baptized in the Spirit, shortly thereafter, you were hit with a wave. Is this really God? Are you just making it up? Is this just stupid emotionalism? What really happened to you? They're crazy. Now, so it's important to prepare people for this eventuality, usually after you've ministered the baptism of the Holy Spirit to them. Now, in our every nation world, we have things like the, the Purple Book and other things which talk about being baptized in the Spirit um, and tools like that are very, very important. And this preparation includes reading the biblical accounts of being baptized in the Spirit. Now, I'll also tell them, whenever you doubt you spoke in tongues, just do it more. I, every day, just pray in tongues. Devil bothers you, pray louder in tongues. And as they do, their faith begins to grow. Now, finally, don't forget that the promises associated with asking keep knocking and seeking in Luke 11, 9 through 13, are in the context of receiving the Holy Spirit. God promises to give his people the Holy Spirit in this passage of Scripture. No matter how long it takes, no matter how hard it seems, God's the promise keeper. So if I've laid hands on something, they go, man, pastor, I, can't, I just can't do it. I'll say, no worries. Let's take a few days and seek as to why. I don't make them feel like they're a failure if it doesn't happen right away. Typically, when people push someone and push someone and keep them there longer and longer, sometimes it's less about the person and more about them. Like they want to see it done. They don't want to feel like they failed. And I have seen, like I say, hundreds of people baptized in the Spirit. Um, but I realize it's God's work. And some people may the best thing they need is to go home and seek God in that work. To go home and ask, is there anything blocking it? Let them draw close to the Spirit of God. Um, and seek, and, if they, and then, then we'll just keep knocking. Here's what I found. Um, 
personally, in my own experience, I've never seen a person that really wants to be baptized in the Spirit not get it. Now, I hear stories of, of the other, otherwise, but that's my own experience. God loves to give the Holy Spirit to his children. Um, I want to say again that we're going to have some questions, and if maybe if some of you haven't been baptized in the Spirit, we're happy to lay hands on you right here today. But the baptism of the Spirit, they say three things. One, remember, he's a Holy Spirit. And when you're baptized in the Spirit, you'll find God wants to make you holy as well. I mean, he's not just some force. He's not just a power button. He's God himself. And the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, can be grieved when we sin, can be quenched when we reject him. You know, Kathy and I determined when we were first married, and we married 39 years this June, we determined we wanted God to be as welcome in our house as he was in our church. That we didn't want to do anything in our home that would grieve him. And so as much as we didn't want to fight to grieve God ourselves, we didn't want the kind of things it describes in Ephesians to grieve the Holy Spirit. Second thing I want to say, never underestimate tongues. Um, in, our, in our SOE world, which is taking place on multiple continents, it, it's really just days in the spirit of God, days in the presence of God. Um, we'll be in Berlin, I think, in September doing a school of prophecy for those with the gift of prophecy. And next year we'll be, I, I, I'm believing in Eastern Europe as well as other places doing things. But tongues is amazing. In our campus ministry program in the United States, the first week is given to six days living in the presence of God. And all of our young campus, at the time they leave, they're praying in, 30, praying in tongues 30 minutes at a time. And just watching what the Holy Spirit can do in six days with someone that wants to stay in his presence. Look for every opportunity to pray in tongues. When you're hurting, pray in tongues. When you don't understand, pray in tongues. It is a very unique doorway into the supernatural. I remember one of my mentors back when the Iron Curtain was still a reality. Um, he was a very unique man. He'd raised multiple people from the dead. And he got to a checkpoint going into Czechoslovakia. And they began to question him. The anointing hit him. He leaped out of the car and just began to talk with them in tongues. And it was perfect Czechoslovakian. It, it's amazing what God can do. It's amazing what God can do through you. And that, that gift of tongues, why it's so important, is it opens the door into the supernatural power of God for you, in your prayers, um, in your witness. But thirdly, as great as tongues is, and as great as we, we cherish that, the ultimate purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is to equip us to witness more, to testify more. Tomorrow morning, I, I have the privilege of doing the closing session in uh, Pastor Wolfie gave me a passage of scripture and laughed. He knows I'm real prophetic and said, mention that scripture and preach whatever God says. But that scripture latched a hold of me on the inside where Paul said he was compelled by the Holy Spirit. And I, I want to talk about, tomorrow morning I'm going to talk about how the power of the Holy Spirit will compel you to mission and not let you go. Now, before we see if there's anybody that needs to be baptized in the Spirit, does anyone have a question? If you do, stand up. Any questions? If not, that's fine so. I put my glasses up in case your hands are up. Hmm. All right, there we are. If you have a question, raise your hand. All right. If you're here this morning, and, or this afternoon, sorry, and you've never been baptized in the Spirit, um, yes. Oh, that's an old book from the 1970s. That's a great book about tongues called They Speak With Other Tongues. Um, I've not read a lot of the modern literature on it, um, but that, that's a great, great classic. Any other questions or comments? Say that again. Fake tongues? 
you know, I guess, I guess it's possible to, to do that. Um, pardon? He asked about fake tongues, like people speaking in tongues that aren't real. Um, in my own experience in praying people for the baptism of the Spirit, I've never seen someone consciously try to fake it, ever. I'm not saying personally, not, yes. You know, he said he saw a ministry experience where the person ministering the baptism told that person, those are false tongues, they're not from God. Um, I would say that's possible, but I wouldn't say it's normal. Like, maybe he sensed this person had some kind of occultic background or something, that's possible. <laughs> if you read some of the old deliverance material written by cessationists who didn't believe, they would have told you for sure tongues was devilish. Um, in my own experience of ministering to people to be baptized in the spirit, I've never seen like an occultic tongue. That doesn't mean it's not possible. Um, and that's where the witness of your spirit is so important. Um, you get around certain parts of the world, anything's possible. Okay, any other questions? Yes, sir, stand up. You know, it is interesting. Um, I've heard that said by others. He said, sometimes when he prays in tongues, it's very repetitive, like he's saying the same phrases over and over and he begins to wonder what's going on and he quits for a while and comes back to it. Um, I would say this, um, I've been praying in tongues a lot of decades, so there are times I do find, like if I'm in spiritual warfare or some moment, my tongues can be very repetitive. I would imagine God's breaking something open. Like I say the name of Jesus a lot, that can be pretty repetitive too. But I've also found myself, I've asked God to expand my gift of tongues. And um, there's sometimes I worship in tongues, or sometimes I war in tongues, pray in tongues. And so repetitive tongues can be very helpful in warfare moments, yes. Anyway, any comments? Someone else, I think a lady, yes, please stand up. What was her comment? Could you, I've got a microphone. No, I, I will, but about children, children being baptized in the spirit. You know, the, the, the oldest age any of my kids were baptized in the spirit was 12. I'll tell you two stories. Uh, the first of my son, Peter, who's, he knows I've been on the Syrian border, been ministering among Muslims for years and years now. He was five years old, and we were going to Kentucky Fried Chicken. We were in line to get my old, back in the my extra crispy. He goes, he lit, we're in the car, and we're in the drive He goes, Daddy, he's five. I go, well, what, son? He goes, the devil's too strong for me, Daddy. I can't stop sinning. <laughs> he's five years old. I go, I, I said, well, you need to be baptized in the Spirit. He says, okay, Daddy. I laid hands on him, and he burst out in tongues in Kentucky Fried Chicken. And then my daughter, Katie, you know, is our youngest biological child. We've adopted some children as well. And uh, she was like three years old. And I'd pray in tongues over her every night. Next thing I know, she's praying in tongues. I thought, ah, that little rascal, she's just imitating me. Probably not tongues. I didn't mind, you know. I, I, didn't, I left it alone. Then she turned four on me. And one of her Sunday school teachers came and she goes, I can't believe your daughter, I'm almost mad. She's four years old, I said, well, what would she do? The boys have been the misbehaviors, not her. And she said, we're, we're on a church fast, and she goes, you're not gonna believe this, pastor. She said, I was teaching four and five-year-olds. And I was getting real convicted because the Holy Spirit told me, you know, if you're gonna fast, you might wanna read your Bible and pray some. <laughs> she was kind of convicting her. She goes, I kind of treat it like a diet, and I said, well, I've done that before. She goes, then your daughter raised her hand. I said, what'd she say? She said, Ticho, Jesus says, read your Bible more. And went right back down to coloring. And then I realized, uh-oh, this little rascal got baptized in the spirit on me. 
And so I think it's astonishing to see children baptized in the Spirit. And Kathy and I, when our children were young, we had a rule. They never went to sleep without one of us by the side of their bed talking and praying with them. The more you get, the harder that gets, I might add. Especially our third son, Robert. He wanted to talk so much, we'd flip a coin to see whose time it was. But anyway, <laughs> we would, it was by their bedside, kneeling by their bed, that we taught them how to hear the Lord. Um, my first boy didn't hear God until he was 12. That was my fault, not his fault. I got better at it. And they go, I say, you know, Jesus loves you. And sometimes when you go to sleep at night, he wants to talk with you. Yes, daddy. I say, why don't you tell Jesus you love him? Then get real quiet. She go, oh, Katie goes, I love you, Jesus. What are you going to say to Katie? And she get real quiet. She goes, oh, daddy, he told me he loves me. Well, that's so formative for them. And can I say one other thing about child rearing here? One of the mistakes that I see parents make is to preach one thing and live another. And I don't mean like sin. I mean this. So we teach our children there's a supernatural, there's an invisible realm. Our kids come down and say, Daddy, there's something real scary in my room. We say, ah, it's all in your mind. Go to sleep. I learned never to do that. I'd march right up to that room. I would pray with them. And I'd say, you know something? This is your room, and Jesus is more powerful. Let's just invite Jesus' presence into this room. And so as a parent, I began to realize if I wasn't careful, I'd teach them one thing but tell them another. Like, Daddy, I, I think I saw something. Ah, it's all in your mind. I said, you saw something in your room. Hmm. Let's ask Jesus to kick it out right now. And so when they're young like that, and so, it's so important that you create an atmosphere for the supernatural. Anyone else? Yes, back there. So, yeah, ran down from the baby room. Just a, a quick query I had. You've listed a lot of things um, to be aware of when administering baptism of the Holy Spirit. I wondered if, if there's a minimum of things you... Uh, before you, you know, try to administer the baptism of the Holy Spirit, are there certain things you should know? Are there certain circumstances where you shouldn't administer the baptism of the Holy Spirit? So is there, and is there like a minimum before you do so, so as well? So I'll make, are there certain circumstances I find myself in a person where I would not minister the baptism of the Spirit to them? Um, and, and also, if there should be a, a certain minimum requirements before you also... Well, yes, I, I definitely want to know they're born again for sure and have trusted in Christ as their Savior. Yes. Um, water baptism is important, but I'd probably still lay hands on them to be baptized in the Spirit. Like, if they were in a place of holding on to sin and anger and bitterness and not wanting to repent, I would not lay hands on them to be baptized in the Spirit. Um, unforgiveness and bitterness creates a blockage to God's Spirit, which is interesting. So... There'd be, a, there'd be rare things, um, but yes, there would be things that would make me say, let's deal with this before we pray for you. Because um, the baptism of the Spirit's about consecration as well. Anyone else? Young lady right there, over there. Okay, my husband gave me permission to ask this for him. He has a friend who uh, got really disillusioned in Christ, so he used to be a Christian. He... He says he used to speak in tongues. Um, then he had a very big disappointment where he prayed for his father, and his father didn't get saved before he died, so then he just rejected God. And now he says that speaking in tongues is totally gibberish, and it's people that speak it are totally delusional. So um, I think he's really influenced my husband into believing that. And I'm just wondering what you would say to that. To my I'll husband. tell you an interesting story about that. You've heard me mention the name Ron Lewis. He's one of our great leaders. He's been all over the world. He's... He's a Jewish believer, one of my dearest friends, and really one of the greatest evangelists I know. And I keep, like Rice Brooks and Franz and others, he's always leading someone to the Lord, always. So he was a couple of years ago on a plane, and because he flies a lot, you fly a lot, you get put in first class free, and he's sitting by this guy. And now, if you sit by Ron, you're as good as saved on the plane. And this guy is from a very high-end cosmetic company and he's a high executive and uh, they're in first class and the guy goes I used to be a Christian Ron goes really used to he goes yeah he said but I he said I'm you know I, I live the gay lifestyle now I 
I'm living, I, I, you know, I have a, a gay husband or whatever. And, and he goes, I used to even pray in tongues. Ron said, you prayed in tongues? He goes, I sure did. He goes, you could do it again. What? And I'm telling you the truth. He goes, what do you mean? Ron goes, oh, heck yes. Gifts of God without repentance. Guy goes, I cannot. Ron says, bet it. I'll lay hands on you in first class right now. I don't recommend this. Ron lays hands on him. He breaks down weeping, sobbing, praying in tongues. Holy Spirit hits him. He rededicates his life to Christ, comes off the plane. He says, this is my mother's number. Call her for me. She's been praying for me 20 years to come back. Ron calls, I'm with your son. He's praying in tongues. He's back. He's sobbing, talking to his mom. Now, Ron has a lot of anointing in that kind of thing. And, but I would say that if someone's spoken in tongues before and been touched by God and someone told me, now I think it's false. And I would say this. I would say, do you think it's false because your experience with it was, didn't feel right? Or are you now looking at your experience through your disillusionment with someone you loved not being healed? And I would engage them in a conversation. I talked to them about the fact that I prayed and prayed for my younger brother to live, and he died, even though he was raised from the dead the first time. Not by me. My dad raised him from the dead. I mean, I would engage him at that. And the fact that, yes, there are some people that live double lives, and there are, who knows, but I would engage him at that point. And I think when someone's been hurt at an emotional level, sometimes speaking out of your own personal experience and finding empathy is even more effective than telling them to read the Bible about it again. And so I think that's recoverable for sure. And I doubt his first experience was false. It's just when you really get hurt and you really get disappointed, that becomes a magnifying glass through which you see everything else. Was there a question over here as well? Yes. Um, I just want to get clarity. Um, are we saying that if, if, if we pray for someone to be filled with the Holy Spirit, that um, we only say you have been filled if one of the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit did manifest? Or are we still encouraging them? You have asked, um, so you are filled, but we're going to trust at a later stage again for a gift you know, that, to manifest. That is a very important question. And so I say normative. By normative, I mean normally. They're going to pray in tongues or have another gift of the Spirit. I have seen people deeply impacted by the Spirit weeping, shaping, shaking, worshiping in English or whatever their native language is and not yet pray in tongues or prophesy, but I have to say they've probably been baptized in the Spirit. It's not the norm. And so in cases like that, I'd say, I believe the Holy Spirit's really empowered you, but he now is going to give you a sign of it, and as you go home and pray, ask for, ask for tongues. But I have so I have seen experiences where I'm convinced that person's baptized in the Spirit, even though they've not yet received like tongues or prophesied or something. And I'll tell them, I really believe you're baptized in the Spirit. But at that point, tongues becomes important to them because praying in tongues continues to build that up. So typically in situations like that, though they're not normal, um, I'll say, listen, I, you've been touched tonight. God's drowned you in his power, whatever phrase I use. And when you go home, ask him now to bring these gifts of the Holy Spirit. That's how I would handle that. Yes, Kathy. I've seen, you ever seen that? I have. I mean, you know, they go, raha, raha, raha. I go, what's wrong? I only got one word. I say one word better than no word. And um, I say, go home and say that one word, you'll get more. That's what I normally do. I try to be really encouraging. And you have to understand, don't get too sober about this. One of the reasons you see me prophesy, I'm, I'm, I seem casual sometimes, is because people are nervous enough without me making it any more nerve-wracking. Anyone else? Any, any other questions? Yes. Okay, this is my question, not my husband's question. Um, how come there's so many Christians who speak tongues, so we are supposed to be filled with power, correct? Why don't we see the power? Why, why aren't more people getting healed? Why aren't, why aren't more of us manifesting the power of the Holy Spirit that we're supposed to be seeing if we're speaking in tongues and filled with the Holy Spirit? That's a, that's a critical question. 
quite honestly, one I've been pondering very deeply um, over the last few months. Um, I do obviously see other gifts of the Spirit manifesting words of knowledge and prophecy and things like that that are definitely God. But when it comes to like true notable healings and miracles, um, I don't see many of them in the, in the Western world. Um, I, I, I've wondered lately, honestly, about Luke 4, when Jesus came um, into his hometown. And I mean, if anyone knew him, it was them. And the Bible said he could only do a few miracles there, which we're all familiar with that story because of their unbelief. But what is shocking is before he left, here's what he told them. He said, this reminds me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to put it, I'm going to apply it. This reminds me in the days of Israel when there was so little faith in Israel that God's prophet went to the land of Jezebel to see a woman son raised from the dead. This reminds me in the days of Israel when only one leper was healed and he was not from Israel. And I've pondered about that, like, why so many times are there more miracles in, like, nations that hardly acknowledge God and hardly know him than there are with us who do know him? People always say it's because we're not really desperate. We've got Western medicine. I don't, I, that may be part of it, but it's not it, not the full it. Um, Jesus was saying the same thing in those countries. None of the countries had like advanced medicine at the time. So I've processed that pretty deeply of late. And I do see clear supernatural things like words of knowledge, prophecy, words of wisdom, those kind of things. But I've surely been pursuing to see more of the miraculous and more of the healings, especially in evangelism. So I wish I had a better answer for you. My answer is that I'm spending a lot of time thinking and pondering and wondering about that. What time are we supposed to stop, Allie? All righty. Before we go, I, I, when, do we start back at 4.30 or something? Okay. Before we go, is there anyone here that's never been baptized in the Holy Spirit and you would love someone to pray for you? If you... If you're here, raise your hand and wave. I see your hand, wonderful. Okay, those with, those with your hands up, um, please. And I, I think there's a lot, of, let's have some of our leaders stay as well, um, here from Europe and any of the, of the leaders that are here. Please come up front and we'll have some people pray for you. Thank you very much and I'll see you at 4.30.